Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I realise I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch, so I'm going to try and truncate and try and focus on a couple of key points. Um, but I thought I'd start by picking up on a point that Colin made this morning, is that people don't really want to have passports. They want to travel. Um, and I have my brand new, shiny new passport. Um, and there's a story behind this that I think speaks to uh, this engagement with government and how it can work and how it cannot work and some of the things that government needs to do. Um, in August, I was over in Singapore training some of Elaine's colleagues at the Civil Service uh, College on digital engagement. And when I came home, threw all my stuff in the wash, went to bed, got up in the morning and found my passport was in my pants. <laughs> so I dried it out over about a week um, just to see how it came out. Then, of course, I went online to the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trades website to look up, you know, how do I know whether my passport is too damaged to actually travel with, whether I could get to New Zealand or not. Um, and I looked throughout the website and I had these things about if your passport is severely water damaged, you must replace it. But what's severe water damage? Like, you could read everything in my passport, it, every page opened, it seemed to, it seemed, as far as I could see, the document worked. Um, so I, I took it into the office of DFAT uh, in Canberra, um, which is where they're actually based, uh, the passport office there, and, and you know, gave it to them and said, you know, I, my passport went through the wash, do I need to replace it? You know, can you just tell me? I just need the answer to that question. And, you know, a couple of them looked at it and handed it back and forth and said, oh, we're, I'm, I'm sorry, we can't tell you. You're going to have to speak to the people uh, at immigration when you're leaving the country. <laughs> and I said, well, I, that's not a great solution for me because, you know, if I'm actually leaving to go to New Zealand, they say they can't use my passport, then that creates a bit of an issue for, you know, several, several people, not only just me, but the conference as well. Um, and, of course, we don't have an international exit point in Canberra, so I couldn't just, you know, wander down to an airport and show it to some people and ask the question. Um, so I tried to get in touch with them through phone and online and had a bit of back and forth, and I finally, by going on Twitter and engaging with both of them, uh, finally immigration came back and said, no, we don't make these decisions, DFAT does. <laughs> So I got involved with DFAT's online. Uh, uh, DFAT directed me via Twitter to their online uh, system. So I went in, filled out their long engaged form. There was no way to attach a photo to it because I was quite happy to send DFAT a photo of my passport to say, is this OK or not? Um, and about uh, nine days later, I got an email back that said, oh, we can't, we, we can't tell you whether it's water damaged or not. You'll have to come into a passport office. So, <laughs> at that point, rather than go round the circle again, I'd done some work with DFAT, um, working with their archives and, and uh, document management section. So I got in touch with someone there who I know personally, gave them the whole background and said, help, how do I resolve this situation? And they got in touch with the head of the passport office there and they said, come in any time, we'll, we'll sit down, talk to you, go through it and check it for you. So I went in there, we resolved it in a matter of five minutes. And they said, yes, it's too damaged, you'll have to replace it. And they said, oh, by the way, because you're now within the, the short period from when you're travelling, you'll have to pay an extra $111 for it. <laughs> now, I didn't ask them to waive that fee, though given it had been an eight-week process, I probably could have. But, you know, even at the end there, when they were finally able to give me the decision, they still wanted to sting me for that. Uh, for a whole thing where, you know, basically they couldn't be able to tell people clearly whether or not a passport was severely water damaged. Now, I think that's one of the challenges when you're dealing with government services and the way government interacts with its people. Uh, people actually don't want government. What they want is a safe and secure society with law and order, where they have opportunities to go out and get a job, to start a business, to have their children educated, to have all the things we expect in a society. We don't actually want a government, but a government is our tool or our mechanism for achieving that goal. So in the same point, people don't actually want libraries. What they want is they want to have a place where they can access information and they want experts who can help them interpret and understand that information so it's meaningful to them. And I think that's the true power and, uh, and, and value of libraries. It's not in these beautiful physical buildings. 
no matter how long they are, no matter how many books they hold. A warehouse can hold a lot of books. It's the expertise of the librarians and the systems that allow people to connect to the information they need when they need it and helps mediate between them and the information when they have difficulties interpreting it. And I know we've talked a lot about uh, literacy as well this morning and, and some of the gaps in literacy. Now, uh, my mother is in her 70s now. Uh, she used to teach people uh, migrants English, um, so she's certainly highly literate. She's got her uh, Facebook page for her business and a website um, and, uh, and sells things online. But she doesn't know how to operate a mobile phone and she certainly can't use apps on a mobile phone. Is she literate? Is she illiterate? With more and more people moving to mobile platforms, you could make an argument to say, well, actually, she's not literate. You know, I can't call her on the mobile phone. I can only call her on a house phone. And that's only when she's not at the hospital seeing to my father or something like that. So you know, there, there are degrees of literacy. And literacy is no longer a linear scale. Where you say, if you can read and write to a certain grade level, you are literate. There's, can you actually view and understand a video on YouTube that may be providing the same information that words give you, but in a different format? Or can you actually produce a video to go on YouTube to communicate and share information with other people? And when we talk about libraries enabling digital citizenship, uh, we have to be careful to look at citizenship in a sort of its complete form. Citizenship is not simply uh, what a government uh, what gives to citizens or what citizens can ask for from government. It's not simply about service provision and obligations. There's also a role for citizens to be involved in the process of governance. You know, our governments are there for citizens, they're comprised of citizens, and they're designed to divine policies and services that actually enable citizens to lead the lives in the ways that you know, they choose within the, the, the sort of the, the framework of a society. So it's, I think it's also important to think about libraries not only as a place to help people access those online services, like participating through censuses, uh, participate through, uh, like it was a great idea, the idea of that uh, dummy uh, voting system. Um, and in fact, Google did run uh, some dummy elections in Australia a few years back where it got 15 to 17 year olds to vote to see who they'd prefer as their preferred governments and prime ministers. Um, and those sort of, there are organisations you can talk to who might be able to enable that here in, in New Zealand as well. Um, but it's also about how do you help citizens and, or enable citizens to contribute back to society and back to their own governance. And I know that can be a fraught matter because there's politics involved and <laughs> libraries are a function of government. So therefore the government of the day doesn't want libraries to take a political stance in any way. But there's many ways to enable citizens to participate that are beyond the political realm. Now, in Australia, we've got uh, something called GovHack, which has been running for about six years. New Zealand was involved for the first time this year, um, which was fantastic. It was a really big deal. And I think uh, it's something that's going to continue here. It was very, very, uh, uh, I think, very engaged a lot of people over here uh, in, its, in its first year in New Zealand. Um, I've been involved with that for a number of years as sort of a commentator, a bit of organising. Last year I won a prize in it, so in a variety of different ways. And one of the elements that have been in it pretty consistently is that libraries have had a role in both providing information that is then used by people to actually create new services and new insights that support governance. And also they've been nodes where people actually physically sit down to actually participate in the actual event on the day. Um, and I think there's a way in which libraries can get more involved and in how can they, can they can be more involved in being part of that way of enabling citizens to take part in those sort of community uh, events that are really digital style events. There are other ways as well. There's everything from, for example, if you're having uh, children's book readings on school holidays, uh, have a someone with Periscope up recording it on the mobile phone so that children in the hospital nearby can participate in the story reading even though they can't physically be there. The walls of the library shouldn't define its reach in the community. So um, I guess really 
just, just to leave you with a, one or two points, just to keep this very brief. Uh, libraries have a crucial role in our communities as one of those, one of the few remaining places where people gather together to exchange information, to learn new things, and to get information interpreted and, and learn new skills. And I think that, and in, in a way that is not high cost, like through courses, or is very, very restricted in who can participate, as parliaments are today. Um, so it's very, very important that libraries use digital in ways that don't only leave them into becoming more of a shop front for local governments or state governments, but actually are an enabler of citizens to increase the richness and fabric of our democratic processes and our societies to enable people to participate fully in society through not only being able to receive information through government and through many of the, the wonderful literary and knowledge sources out there, but also to create it and share it themselves and participate fully in the life of the community. So digital is a great mechanism for enabling it. It's not the be all and end all, and it certainly isn't the only mechanism. Libraries have been doing this for decades in other ways, but with all the shiny toys that we have today and all the, the wonderful new social tools that appear every year, it's important to stick to what are the fundamentals of what you're trying to achieve. And I think that's about enabling citizenship, enabling people to participate in society, and using the tools that we have, such as digital tools, in order to further that goals within your environment. So thank you very much.